<laughs> while we're getting our technical issues worked out. Um, I want to thank, uh, uh, join uh, Dave and Charlize and the rest of the NIH Citizen Science Working Group on thanking you for joining us this morning, those of you here in the room with us today and also those of you out in the, the virtual space of the Twitterverse and beyond. I'm very happy to have you join us. Um, now that you're all tanked up on your exciting bread and water breakfast and your brisk walk in the Washington weather here this morning, um, should be a really productive day of discussion. Let's see. So, um, I just want to give you a little bit of background on citizen science here at NIH and what we've been thinking and uh, what we've done here over the past couple of years and uh, by way of intro to this particular workshop. So um, I want to start with just a little bit of a definition here just because um, we're often asked to define citizen science and we're often asked to delineate it from these other terms here on the slide. So for us, you, you already saw this in Charlize's slide, but citizen science is just at its essence an approach to research that involves the public directly in the research process. So not just as subjects of the research or advisors to the research, but direct partners and collaborators in all aspects of the research process, everything from data collection and, and uh, donation or sharing of data all the way through the analysis of that data and um, ultimately in uh, priority setting and, and um, analyzing results. Um, the other terms that I've shown on here, um, community-based participatory research and crowdsourcing, you know, we can haggle over the exact boundaries of this Venn diagram. It's a moving space. I, I couldn't quite, um, I'm not artistically talented enough to make a moving Venn diagram here, but it's a rapidly evolving space and these terms are sort of changing meaning over time. And, and I think really they're converging because they're converging on this idea of um, a more active role of the public in the research process itself. And all three of those terms sort of share uh, some methodologies and some tools, some data science needs. There's an increasing reliance in all of them on things like uh, the use of challenges and games, and we'll talk more about that in just a sec. Um, so back in 2013, which seems like eons ago now in this field, which changes so quickly, uh, we had our first workshop on citizen science here at NIH. The idea was that we had seen a lot of success in other fields, um, ecology and astronomy notably for citizen science, and we hadn't seen a lot of activity in the biomedical space, and we knew we weren't supporting very much in the biomedical space, we NIH. Um, so we reached out to the folks in the, the biomedical sphere that we could see were actively pr doing biomedical uh, citizen science back in 2013, and they're, they're shown here by their logos on the slide. That's who was at the meeting. Um, the, that workshop was chaired by Sharon Terry and Stephen Friend, and, uh, and it was a really good meeting. It kind of gave us the, the lay of the land at the time, what was going on, and, um, and, and what the potential was for citizen science in the biomedical sphere, and specifically what the potential was for NIH-supported research in citizen science in the biomedical sphere. So um, what came out of that first workshop were some uh, revelations and, and recommendations here. Um, the idea that um, biomedical research really can benefit from the creativity and problem-solving skills of the public, and also from citizen-collected data and insights that aren't obtainable through conventional approaches. So we don't think of these approaches as displacing any of our current methods. Um, nothing's going to replace double-blind clinical trials, for example. But um, all of these new approaches that are emerging in the citizen science space really have the potential to um, to enable research that, that isn't doable in other ways. Um, but biomedical research poses really unique, some unique challenges for citizen science that, that isn't um, as important in things like astronomy, where stars don't really care if you share their personal information and, and that sort of thing. Um, there's also some technical issues, you know, that, that arise in the scientific world when we think about using um, uh, data collected by the public, for example, in terms of um, sort of accuracy of the data and that sort of thing and, and analysis. Um, the, what we saw in 2013 was that the early efforts that were out there showed some promise, um, but that biomedical research really, and this was the, the thinking of the, the, the group that was here uh, two years ago, that biomedical research, uh, re biomedical citizen science really would uh, benefit from a more rigorous scientific assessment, and that these new methods have the potential to complement rather than replace existing research approaches. And then obviously the key recommendation at the bottom here. Um, that we, we needed to, before we really did too much else, we needed to really think more, investigate more, understand more the ethical, legal, social implications of citizen science in the biomedical space, um, thus all of you here today. So um, the challenges that were raised um, by that group, uh, you know, the challenges and the opportunities kind of intersect here. So. Um, 
but, but the idea was that um, these methods are still relatively new in biomedical research. It's not totally clear what can be adapted to the, the biomedical space and what can't, what's going to work under what conditions. Um, our current policies, regulations, and practices really weren't designed for citizen science. And um, in particular, uh, IRBs, for example, don't really know what to do when investigators come to them and want to use uh, citizen science approaches. Um, <clears throat> we talked about the creation of flexible infrastructure and governance models that enable multiple levels of participation while maintaining data security, integrity, and scientific rigor. So this is the idea of really putting the, the, uh, the, the, the person, the public, in the driver's seat here of deciding what to share when, how to collaborate, that sort of thing, while maintaining a level of scientific rigor in the research. Um, they said that methods needed to be developed and adapted and rigorously tested so that we know what works and what doesn't. There's a whole lot of methodologies out there, and it, it's sort of some of this is beginning to happen, but it's still unclear which of those methods work best under uh, for which kinds of research questions. And they they uh, said that dissemination of tools, best practices, and training resources would be critical. This is something that we've taken to heart here at, at um, NIH. We're thinking about how to make some of these methods, these resources, more broadly available. I know that's also going on out in the, the rest of the community. Um, various other organizations are thinking about, uh, you know, platforms and, and web resources to make some of these methods. There, there are new journals um, out there. Um, so we're beginning to sort of accumulate all of this information in a way that's, uh, that people can access. Um, and the, the group also um, uh, showed the need for evaluation of citizen science approaches to, to research, um, saying, so, you know, we don't really know how to evaluate and, and review these kind of approaches. But the opportunities are big here. Um, for the most part, what came out of that think tank and what we've seen um, more generally is that the public is eager and able to solve problems if presented with the right tools and the right opportunities under the right conditions. Um, a lot of caveats there, but you get it. Um, patients and healthy individuals are generally motivated to collect and share personal health data. Obviously, this varies by group, it varies by person, it varies under different conditions, it varies depending on what the disease or the condition is, and it, and it varies by the sort of background of the individuals and thus the sort of flexible governance models um, enabling uh, multiple levels of participation. Um, all of this sort of needs to be taken into consideration when we think about how to set these studies up. Um, but initial applications of these methods in biomedical um, science have shown some utility and applied effectively. Um, there's a, a general agreement that there's an opportunity here to accomplish research that we really can't accomplish other using more traditional methods. So, whoops, um, well, all right. Um, so following up on the, the recommendations of the think tank, we've been doing a few things here. Um, NIH sometimes moves slowly, but we move carefully. Um, we have been following up on the recommendation to learn more from other communities to begin to leverage what else is out there, and that means um, other fields, things besides biomedical research, but also um, the community-based participatory research area that we have long supported. Um, there's a lot of lessons to be learned there. We've become active participants in the federal community of practice for crowdsourcing and citizen science. Some of those folks from other agencies are here in the room with us today. Um, we've learned a lot from them about how to support this kind of research in the federal space, um, and, and they are likewise um, wanting to hear what you all have to say here today because the, the ethical, legal, social implications are big in biomedical research, but they cut across some other fields as well. Um, we're going to be uh, presenting a panel uh, with some of the experts here in the room and again out there in the, in the, the, the space beyond. Um, at the upcoming Citizen Science Association meeting, that's the meeting happening here in February. Um, we have a panel, we'll, we'll show that all to you guys here in a little bit. Um, and there are additional panels on biomedical research, I think, going to happen at that meeting. Um, there's one on environmental science also, and some of the folks here in the room are participating in that one. Um, we've done some additional investigation into some of the areas that the original think tank um, recommended as sort of immediate opportunities. And one of, the, one of the early sort of immediate opportunities is this idea of um, engaging the game developer community in developing more biomedical research games, really leveraging the wealth of expertise and technical resources that are out there in the game developer world to bring those to bear on um, biomedical research in creative ways. At the time, we saw things like Folded and Cell Slider, and since then there's been the development of additional games. Um, back in December, well, last month, we brought together uh, 10 of those game developers and 10 biomedical researchers and had uh, 
a very, very um, active and exciting discussion with them about how to bring those two communities together, how to form more partnerships and begin to uh, develop more of these games. Um, a report from that will be coming out soon. We did that uh, workshop in conjunction with the NIH Big Data to Knowledge Program. Um, so the report will be pu uh, put on their website. And then obviously um, our, our next step here is the, the meeting at hand here with uh, following up on the ethical legal social implications. So there are also um, additional workshops and things being held by the different institutes. You know, NIH has 27 different institutes and centers focused on diseases and organ sites and development and aging and whatnot. Um, several of them are following up on citizen science topics specific to their missions. So just really quickly, last slide, because I think I'm getting the wave here, um, is, uh, you know, the, I, I wanted to just leave you with the idea of uh, where we think citizen science can have an impact in NIH-sponsored research space. So NIH supports research across a, a wide range of topic areas, and I think you saw that in Charlize's slide earlier. Um, and we can imagine citizen science, you know, spoiler alert here, the, the answer is I think citizen science can have an impact in almost every aspect of NIH-supported research space. Certainly we've seen um, crowdsourcing and challenges and things work very well in technology development, computational methods and software. Um, we can imagine um, better understanding the underlying biology of health and disease um, easily through things like uh, games, but one can imagine other methods in citizen science being applied there as well. Um, we can see potential for impact in um, translational research and therapeutic development, screening and risk assessment. Certainly areas like um, environmental factors have been very active in, in uh, community-based participatory research and more and more in the citizen science arena um, with the crossover with the ecology field there. And all aspects of um, epidemiology, um, certainly things like wearable technologies, sensors, mHealth, nutrition and lifestyle, that kind of uh, data is incredibly difficult to collect under um, sort of traditional research um, conditions, but you can imagine that citizen science approaches uh, lend themselves really readily to, um, to uh, collecting, utilizing, and analyzing that kind of data. So anywhere that we can see the creativity and capabilities and the unique insights from the public um, coming into bear in creative ways, um, I, we can imagine citizen science approaches being useful for biomedical research. So. I'm just going to leave it there for um, any quick questions that you might have. Otherwise, I'm going to turn it back over to Dave and Charlize to uh, bring it back around to the ethical, legal, and social implications of all of this. Okay. Everybody's uh, starved on their bread and water diet here. <laughs>